Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dr. Peggy Bernash, and I thank you for coming to our event to celebrate the launch of the Beniba Center for Slavery Studies at the University of Glasgow. There's currently four or five more people trying to enter our room. So as this is happening, six or seven people trying to enter, I wanted to just give you a little bit of housekeeping. Everyone should be muted and this is on purpose so that we don't get a cacophony of too many voices happening at once. However, it is your choice to have your video camera on or off, but I should also let you know that this is being recorded. So if that's a, a concern for you, then it is uh, fine for you to keep your, your cameras off. Later in the program, we're going to have some time for discussion. So if you have questions or comments, we don't have a question and answer box for this, but we do have a chat button at the bottom that you can add your question or inquiry in, as well as various comments. We do have a couple of people who are helping out with uh, hoping to monitor how many questions and comments that come in. Now, um, as things are happening, um, we, as it always does with these kinds of virtual rooms, there seems to be a couple of people that um, we're still waiting to come in and have not been able to make it. So we'll proceed as, as one can. But no worry, the vast majority of us um, are here for all that we want to experience. May I also ask that um, as a descendant of enslaved peoples, I also look to my ancestors and say thank you for allowing me to be present today and wish for their blessings upon such an occasion as we're having right now. Without further ado, I will begin um, the program with a, a brief introduction and of course go into uh, the some of the ideas and thoughts and, and parts of the program that hopefully everyone will find quite engaging. So, 2020 has given repeated testimony that our modern world with all of its technological advancements and legalities of societal progression towards equality has demonstrated that we are still caught in the grips of slavery and empire's legacies. In terms of what that means for us today here in Scotland, I should give you a little background. The University of Glasgow has always celebrated its historical and anti-slavery sentiments and activities, highlighting stories about how its staff consciously avoided slave holding or slave trading practices and instead produced abolition-based content. But in 2016, at the request of local activists, the university's senior management group commissioned a history of slavery's steering committee and approved a year-long study by historians, Professor Simon Newman and Dr. Stephen Mullen to explore the university's true links to slavery and the slave trade. And this produced a report and in their findings of the 2018 report, it turns out that um, Glasgow, the university financially benefited from slavery through slave related bursaries, endowments, mortifications and gifts. The report also included several recommendations to repair the damage and structural disadvantages cast upon enslaved Africans and their descendants. The senior management group and steering committee's decision was unanimous. A program of reparative justice must be drafted and executed for the coming decade. 
So the University of Glasgow set itself on a path of institutional activism through a program of reparative justice. The media were keen to capture the summer events of 2019. The University of the West Indies and the University of Glasgow both signed an historic agreement, a memorandum of understanding for reparative justice. And the depth of meaning and the full validation required witnesses on both sides of the ocean. First, at the University of West Indies regional headquarters in Kingston, Jamaica, and then again here at the University of Glasgow. Another recommendation outlined in the 2018 report is the creation of a center, a research unit internal to the university for the study of historical slavery and its legacies. And here, and here we are two short years later at its launch. But I must highlight one particular colleague who is responsible for much of the groundwork that got us here. We must formally recognize the tireless efforts of Dr. Christine White, lecturer in global history with a focus on West Africa, slavery and abolition. Thank you, Christine, for doing the good work that is so often unacknowledged and for securing the center's first endowment gift from the Merchant's House of Glasgow. And thank you to the Merchant's House for responding to the organization's historical links to slavery through reparative justice. This interdisciplinary center will combine scholarly research and teaching with public humanities, increasing knowledge and enhancing the understanding of both historical and modern slavery, as well as the legacies of modern day society. The center's objectives include collaboration with museums, schools, and coordination of new courses and the eventual development of programs of study that focus on slavery, trafficking, and their effects. Now, what underpins the Beniba Center for Slavery Studies is an anti-racism position in philosophy, mission, and most importantly, in practice. By this, I specifically mean we will engage in active transformational action to identify historical and contemporary racism and work to change structural systems, policies, and practices so that we walk forward towards a true societal equity. Now, let me be clear. Any and all who choose to associate with or claim allyship with the center should also make an anti-racism stance as part of their practice. We begin with the conscious acknowledgement of those who came before us. The Beniba Center is named in honor of an enslaved woman who forcibly labored on the Lucky Hill Sugar Estate in Jamaica during the last two decades of the 18th century, a plantation owned by Lord Robert Cunningham Graham, a former university rector of Glasgow. We know so little about Beniba beyond her name, her value as one of Graham's human properties, and that she had at least one child whose name we don't know. But in naming the center in her honor, we are compelled to say her name, linking both Beniba and the center to the contemporary social movement spearheaded by scholar and activist Kimberly Crenshaw, a movement that fights for the forgotten black female victims of state sanctioned brutality and anti-black violence. We have chosen to launch on a Tuesday for Beniba is a West African day name. Related to the Akan ethnic group, Beniba is the day name for girls born on a Tuesday. And so this is the day for celebration. Beniba's influence will surpass Lord Graham's minimal regard for her humanity. Despite what Lord Graham chose not to record or value about Beniba, we will remember her 
and the hundreds of thousands that came before and after her. On this day, we ask you to bear witness to Scotland's first research center for the study of historical slavery and its legacies, including modern slavery and trafficking. I speak for everyone who has been involved over the past few years to see all their work come to fruition. Thank you to all who are present now in our virtual room <coughs> for coming in honor, remembrance, and celebration. We hope that you join our path for anti-racism activism. To encourage and inspire all of us, we have several speakers and performances. As my colleagues and I believe that the Beniba Center should serve our diversity, our diverse community, we're including persons within and outside of academia. As a research unit, we're keen to build international and interdisciplinary networks with scholars and other research centers such as the International Slavery Museum and Center for the You're unmuted. You've muted yourself. You've muted yourself. I don't know how I did that. <laughs> you must have pressed something. <laughs> ah, well, let me start with the last paragraph. My apologies. To encourage and inspire all of us, we have several speakers and performances. As my colleagues and I believe that the center should serve as our should serve our diverse community, we've included persons within and outside of academia. As a research unit, we're keen to build international and interdisciplinary networks with scholars and research centers, such as the International Slavery Museum and Center for the Study of International Slavery at the University of Liverpool the National Museum of African American History and Culture in Washington, DC, the Institute for the Study of Slavery at the University of Nottingham, the Center of International, the Center International de Recherche sur l'esclavage at CNRS in Paris, the Center for the Study of Slavery and Justice at Brown University, the National Institute for the Study of Dutch Slavery and its legacies in Amsterdam, and so many more that I can't name. We want to involve Scotland's Black and ethnic minority communities and collaborate with heritage centers, political activists, and strategic racial equality organizations to promote racial justice here in Glasgow and further afield. And of course, we must certainly expect to serve the needs of our university staff and students. Now, we wanted to begin with a reading from one of Scotland's most celebrated writers. I'm not sure, did she, did we get her in? Does anyone yeah. know? Yes, I'm here. Yes, great. <laughs> okay, so I'll continue with the introductions. We'll begin with a reading by one of Scotland's most celebrated writers and poets, Jackie Kay. In honor of today's momentous occasion, Ms. Kay will read a passage from one of her admired literary works. Originally produced as a play, then re-released as an epic poem, Lamplighter is a deeply emotive study, sorry, story of struggle, survival, and the resilience of four black women through Britain's legacy of slavery. Next, we'll have several speakers to briefly share their thoughts on the Bediba Center's role and potential impacts. First up will be Glasgow's counselor, Graham Campbell. Then we'll have the University of Glasgow's professor, Helen Minnis of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry. Next will be Nigerian Scottish fourth year, Toby Adebayu as our student representative for this launch. After Toby will be the University of West Indies lecturer, Cleve Scott. 
We're also lucky to have Miles Greenwood, the newly appointed curator of the legacies of slavery and empire at Glasgow Museums. And our final speaker will be human rights activist, Zandra Yaman. After the presentations, we'll continue with a discussion with our speakers, myself, and you, the participants in the audience. After which our event will conclude with a short recorded performance by Scotland-based opera singer, Andrea Baker. So I think we're ready to get started. May we have Jackie provide us with a wonderful passage from her re-released story. Thank you. Thank you. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, finally managed to get into the Zoom room. I was locked out for a wee while, but I'm I'm in I'm in now. Um, I thought I'd I'd actually start with reading a poem that I wrote especially for Glasgow uh, University. Um, as you were referring to it earlier, the repatriation of money. So I'll read this poem and then I'll read the extract from the Lamplighter. This is called Flag Up Scotland, Jamaica. Here's the theft that grew and grew. Here's the debt that's overdue. Here's the clock that ticks and ticks. Here's the moment history picks. Here's the sun that shines a gold. Here's a ship with lethal hold. Here's the wrong that made you slave. Here's the song that made you brave. Here's a hand that starts amends. Here's Jamaica, Glasgow, friends. Here's the gold, the green, the black, here's the past we can't take back. Here's a gesture, late but true. Here's two saltires raised for you. Here's a redress that's long been owed. Here's the first step on the road. I was really interested when I was writing The Lamplighter to see how many different cities um, across the UK have different museums that acknowledge their legacy with the slave trade and how that was missing in, in Scotland. And so I'm really, really um, pleased that the Beniba Centre uh, has been born and is here. And it does, it does feel as so many of you that have been working on this project will, will feel so long overdue. So I wanted in the Lamplighter particularly to draw attention to Glasgow um, itself. So this passage that I've chosen um, has a lot of Glasgow in it. McBean. I put them all in leg irons, and if not, if that not be enough, why then I handcuff them. If the handcuffs be too little, I put a collar around their neck with a chain locked to a ring bolt on the deck. If one chain won't do, I put two, and if two won't do, three. You may trust me for that. These are not cruelties, they are matters of course. There is no carrying on the trade without them. Lamplighter. May 27, 1731, the slave ship Neptune off port of Glasgow dropped anchor in Carlisle Bay, Barbados. On board were 144 Africans who'd been shackled for nearly a year with leg irons. Mary, and alas, I was weary, weary old Black Harriet. I belong to Glasgow, and Glasgow belongs to me. Lamplighter. Some stories don't have a name to their voice. I built these houses brick by brick. Black Harriet. My head is on the red brick customs house in Liverpool in between the elephants. Lamplighter. The tobacco's merchant's house, the trades hall, the gallery of modern art, venturer's house. Black Harriet. London, Liverpool, Bristol, Manchester, Glasgow belongs to me. Constance, William Cooper, the poet, wrote, I pity them greatly, meaning me. I pity them greatly, but I must be mum, for how could we do without sugar and rum? McBean, instructions sent by the Bristol firms of Isaac Hobhouse. Let your netting be fixed breast high, fore and aft, and so keep them shackled and hand bolted. We hope this will find you with a fine parcel of Negroes ready to put on board. Endeavour to purchase a hundred boys and girls from 10 to 14 years of age. Observe 
that the boys and girls you buy be very black and very handsome. Constance, I landed in Barbados, bought by the Royal Africa Company. I was a child. One of six of us were children. Aniwa, I was a girl once. I wonder if I am still a girl. Maybe not a girl anymore. Maybe I've grown into a small woman without my mother. I can hardly remember the girl I was or if I ever was a girl. I'm the ghost of a child. I am your past. I landed in Jamaica in the 1720s. I was a child. They named me Mary MacDonald McBean. In 1770, on the island of Jamaica, there were 100 black people called MacDonald. A quarter of the island's people were Scottish. Black Harriet. My daughters have Scottish blood. Scotland has my blood. MacBean. There was a network of Argyle Campbells, at least 100 strong in Jamaica, concentrated in the West, places names such as Campbelltown, Argyle, and Glen Isla. The Lamplighter. My story is the story of Great Britain, the United Kingdom, the British Empire. Black Harriet. In 1756 in Liverpool, there was an auction at the Merchant's Coffee House for 83 pairs of shackles, 11 slave collars, 22 pairs of handcuffs, four long chains, 34 rings, and two traveling chains. Constance, 1760, in London, an iron gag muzzle, especially designed for use on Africans, was offered for sale by ironmongers. Lamplighter, chained two by two, right leg and left leg, right hand and left hand, each African had less room than a man in a coffin. Boom, boom, boom. McBean, buried a man slave, number 84, buried a boy slave, number 47, buried a girl slave, number 126. Finally, into the seas, moving steadily, and filling, cyclonic becoming northwesterly, severe gale nine later, new high expected by same time tomorrow, by the same time tomorrow, McBean. The moon that night was cleaved in half, the night that the ships landed in the Americas, the slaves were shined and sold. When the ships unloaded their slaves, the ship's shelves were reloaded with sugar, tobacco, rum, heading for London, Liverpool, Glasgow, rum weather, Moderate, not good. Fog, thick as syrup. Visibility poor. Shannon, Rockall, west or northwest. Backing southeast, six to eight. Occasionally, very high in the west. Soul, lamplighter. Becoming very rough, rough, rough or very rough. Becoming very rough, rough, very rough. Becoming very rough. Nat is the end of the shipping forecast. I'll leave it um, there, but you can see from that that there were kind of four different voices and four very different experiences. And one man that tells the story might be um, of slavery almost through the shipping news because the story of slavery, as we all know, was also a story of the triangular slave trade and involved so many deaths at sea. I wanted to find a, a way of um, of recording that. Thank you for having me. I'll I'll stop now and make room for the next speaker. Thank you so much, Jackie. Uh, it is hard to hear your work and it not. Um, I feel overwhelmed much of the time, so I I'm going to collect myself <laughs> and. Um, We'll look to our, our next speaker, who I'm very happy to say is, is an ally and, and a new friend. Mm -hmm. um, may, may we please welcome Glasgow Councillor Graham Campbell. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Peggy. And uh, it's an honor to follow um, 
Jackie on this because uh, I, I heard her first performance of this on the day we unveiled that plaque in the university chapel at the time of the signing of the memorandum of understanding between Glasgow University and the University of West Indies and it was uh, a real heartfelt moment to be there with other Jamaicans to see the Jamaican flag flying over the campus to see that plaque unveiled to hear that poem uh, it, it did make us cry a bit actually have to be honest it did uh, so I want to thank Jackie for that because that gave us such a moment uh, we didn't know it was coming so from flag up Scotland Jamaica point of view it was a real nice surprise so I want to say oh. formally publicly thank you for that um, I suppose where I come in on this is I'm the sort of I'm the sort of gentleman amateur uh, sort of uh, Sorry, Jackie, you, you're still on. <laughs> All right. Um, I'm the gentleman amateur in this, in one sense. I'm not a historian. I'm somebody who's a community activist, uh, but I, I work with historians. And I think the key point about how we've got here is that it's the work of historians doing amazing work. The Christines, the Peggy's, and also the Stephen Mullins. You have to shout out Stephen, because without the work I've done with Stephen over the last uh, 12, 13 years, uh, I, I don't think I would be sitting here either. Um, we, we began really with a discussion about the heritage of Glasgow's built architecture. And looking back through where the source of those wealth came from, we, we realized you know, that Glasgow's connection with the particular West India sugar merchants, but also with tobacco and cotton was so deep and so wide ranging that it could no longer possible to be, be ignored. That, Glasgow's deep connection with this. But we realized that we had to get evidence of this that the public would accept and that indeed authorities would accept is major and important, and therefore would lead to some kind of difference. I've been persuaded of reparative justice all my adult life and I've fought for reparations, but I've always fought for it in a very sort of almost abstract way with the expectation almost that you wouldn't get it because you know when you're criticizing a system that's so long lived as this one is, uh, you, 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 you realize how long a struggle it's been, hundreds of years in, in the making, and that to change where the racism originally came from and to try and create new structures is such a difficult ask when racism is so hardwired into the DNA of all the structures that we have with its courts, police, uh, the council itself, you know, the, the many people who sat in my seat in the chambers uh, before me would never have imagined that someone like me would even be there. So. I felt in many ways often very incredibly lucky to even be alive, to have survived this journey, to have that Scottish legacy in, in my ancestry. And that, you know, it probably dawned on me how important this was. Finally, I mean, I've, I've lived in Scotland for a long time and it took me a while to feel confident to in, explore this Scottish side of my heritage. When uh, Ebo Cooper, who is a famous musician from Jamaica, he's the keyboard player in Third World, and he's now the sort of music teacher at uh, the Jamaica School of Music, uh, head of that school. But he came in 2013 as part of the Commonwealth Games cultural uh, preparations, and he came with the, the Caribbean delegation, and he visited the Mitchell Library. And in the Mitchell Library was documentation galore about the shipping records, about the, the financial records, the banking records, and they the actual maps of the plantations owned by the Scottish family who had originally enslaved his ancestors. He was able to actually find on a map in that library, helpfully provided by the Mitchell Library staff to pinpoint the exact point on the map where the Cooper family had enslaved his ancestors. So that was deep and important. The fact that that is here in Glasgow, that that deep recorded history is there is an asset that we must make available and open to African people affected by this legacy all over the world. And it, it was so important that it was such a movie that he'd actually be there when he, he discovered this. Uh, and I realized, oh, right, I probably got this too. <laughs> and I've held off <laughs> looking into my personal uh, history because that's something to be saved up for later. But for right now, I felt that it was important for us to recognize this legacy in, in, the, in the, the city. So. When Flag Up Scotland Jamaica were formed at that time at the Commonwealth Games, we told the story of slavery. We were brave as a city in 
having a lot of cultural activity from the Empire Cafe through to my own play Emancipation Acts to the Bloodlines by Lou Prendergast, so a number of cultural events that we used to make, to remember that slavery legacy at that time when we were hosting the whole Commonwealth. But it, it then dawned on me that the university needs to be approached. So myself and Stephen approached Dr. John, Professor John Briggs, who was the then head of Senate. And we had that discussion about, well, how can we make this legacy come alive? And this was in uh, November 2015. We would just presented a petition to Parliament asking for Scotland of Jamaica's historic legacy through slavery to be recognised and therefore for Jamaica to be recognised as a country of special importance to Scotland. Uh, we were accepted by the petition committee and then we approached John Briggs. John, to his great credit, came back with, well, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll fund a study. We'll look into it. We'll take a study in, into what was the financial legacy of the slavery bequests that the university got. And when we, when Stephen did that research, that was published in 2018, and that was groundbreaking in this respect, that it provided very specific proof of the wide ranging slavery donations. If I remind you of that research, it, it found that uh, of the 50 large donations, large donations being above uh, the value, I think, of 500 pounds in those days, in the 18, uh, 80s. Uh, those 24 of those 50 large donations were from families with a connection to slavery, uh, whether they were textiles, whatever they were, sugar, whatever. Uh, and of course, the college is on the land of Robert Bogle, who was himself a plantation owner Jamaica. So it was right that we were unveiling plaques to it. But at that time, people didn't quite know how much Glasgow University was mired in it. And that was the, found to be the value of 200 million pounds. <laughs> Nobody thought that it would be that much money in today's money, but a huge amount of money to build the Gilbert Scott building from the coffers of people who benefited in, in their family legacies from slavery. Uh, so once we had that out, that had a big ripple effect, and I know that it, it influenced a lot of other universities to start their own reparative justice journeys, and it, it set a trend I, I, in a way. Um, to me, though, I have to be honest, I, I see that that was a first step. This is very much the very next massive major step. We've renamed buildings, of course, we've got the James McCune Smith Lecture Theatre, the Student Hub. Uh, that's coming, biggest, most expensive building we've ever built in Glasgow, probably, but it's going to be named after the first medical student who went on to, of course, found the, the African Caribbean, African American Communities Health Service in the new, great New York area. So he's pretty much the founder of public health in there, but he got his medical degree in 1837 from Glasgow. That's a great thing to remember, and that every student who walks through that building and studies there will know his name. But the next step, unveiling that plaque, and the next step, forming this amazing institution. And the final thing I want to say about this, which I think ought to be said, uh, as a nationalist in this respect, as the uh, member of a party which was founded by Robert Bontine Cunningham Graham, it is incumbent upon me to mention the fact that his ancestor is the Cunningham Graham that we've just been talking about. And he wrote a biography of this man in 1925, which is a way, his way of breaking with that slavery ancestor, but his own education, you know, R.B. Cunningham Graham had founded the, what's now the Labour Party. He was there with Kay Hardy. He then went on to found the SNP. You know, so he is, he's a founder of both the main political parties in this country uh, of a left persuasion. So the fact that his slavery ancestor in his book, uh, Doughty Deeds, didn't quite fully go into the full uh, uh, legacy of where his education and wealth had come from but at least he made some amends by fighting for human rights and civil rights of ordinary working people in his life as a politician. Uh, and, and I think that legacy needs to be remembered and this study center will go a massive long way. It's important to us as a community, it's important to scholars everywhere, but particularly to African Caribbean scholars right here in Scotland, who now know there is a home that recognizes that legacy, that tells that truth, and that the scholars and students well after us for a long time to come, for 20 years at least to come, will be here digging up that um, inc sometimes inconvenient truth. Thank you so much, Graham.
Next, we would like to hear from Professor Helen Minnis. Helen? Hi, thank you so much for inviting me to speak at this wonderful event. I'm a proud Glaswegian. I'm a proud graduate of Glasgow University. And I'm also proud to have slave ancestors. So when I was 18, um, my very dear cousin Ruth came over to stay with us from the Bahamas. So my dad was from the Bahamas and just about everybody in the Bahamas is called Minnis. Everyone's my sister, cousin, auntie, child. But Ruth had been doing some research she opened a big sheet of paper, which was our family tree. And it went right back to Hugh and Diane Minnis, who were slaves. I was 18 and my blood pressure went up and I don't think it's ever completely come right down because to have that direct link with people who toiled in the hot Caribbean sun um, and who didn't have the same opportunities as I did was, it had such a powerful effect on me. Their, their son Morris uh, was also born into slavery but was then freed and, and my wonderful husband has actually made t-shirts for, for my kids with their names on it because we like to speak their names as often as we can because it's the only thing we know about them and we don't know anything about their ancestors. But the name Minnis is a Scottish name, we believe. Um, we understand that Minnis was from the clan McMinn and Mingus and apparently sheep stealers from Scotland were sent to the Bahamas. So I have Scottish blood in my veins from the Caribbean side. And it feels as though this has come full circle in a beautiful way because my father, after the Second World War, got a post-war scholarship to come and study in Scotland. And there he met my mum my mum was at Edinburgh University and she was the president of the Cosmopolitan Club. I am a white girl from Yorkshire. Uh, she used to say my parents didn't expect me to be quite as, con as cosmopolitan as to marry a black man in 1956. But they had a happy, a happy marriage. Um, and I had a, a wonderful upbringing in Scotland and graduated from Glasgow Medical School. But I graduated from Glasgow Medical School never having heard the name James, James McCune Smith, despite the fact, as Graham Campbell has just said, James McCune Smith was the founder of the Royal Statistics Institution. He was an, one of our most proud alumni and he graduated top of his class. So I am so grateful to Glaswegians, um, fellow, fellow adopted Glaswegians like Graham, um, colleagues like Christine who have built this centre and who have helped Glasgow University to be the first university in the United Kingdom to really own up to our links with historical slavery. When I, when I became a professor in 2015, the structural inequalities that are the direct result of slavery were really brought home to me because it wasn't until that moment that I realised I was literally in 2015, only the 18 black women professor in the United Kingdom. And there are still only 20 something of us. We're in a small club. <laughs> and the fact that there are so few of us shows the low expectations, the educational inequalities, et cetera, that are the direct result of our involvement in the transatlantic slave trade. And I think I just want to finish um, by saying that I'm so proud to be part of a university that is 
continuing to take steps to make reparations. And I just want to remind us all that this is not history. This is now. This is affecting us now. These are my ancestors. And I want to honour them. And let's do that by continuing with this wonderful work. Thank you so much. And thank you, Helen. My goodness. The 18th Black female professor in the UK. The fact that we can still count on so few digits is is a problem and, and obviously an aspect of, of structural inequalities and equity that we, we need to continuously challenge. Uh, next, I'd like to shift a little bit to our, uh, our only student on the panel. I felt it was, it was necessary to not just have um, scholars um, activists who've been in on this for a long time. I wanted to have a student to be able to talk about where they stand in all of this as they're on their their path to their career or or however they're seeing their involvement in an activism like this. So may we please now um, turn our attention to to Toby. Hi everyone, um, my name is Toby and I'm the president of the African Caribbean Society here at Glasgow University. Um, I'm currently a fourth year student at the University of Glasgow. I'm so honoured and I'm so excited that I was asked to come here and speak today as I feel like it's really important that our voices as black students are heard. Just a little bit about my story. Um, I'm originally Nigerian, but I grew up in Scotland a majority white country. And in fact, I grew up in Aberdeen, a majority white city. And I spent a lot of my time trying to navigate through majority white spaces. My, my family and I experienced a lot of racism when we moved over here, both covert and overt. And it was things that when it happened, you didn't really notice that it was racism. It wasn't until you went and reflected about it and you were like, no, no, that was definitely racist. It was things like when we were, you're walking around the store and the shopkeeper is following you around the store because they think you're about to steal something because you're black. Or it was when you're walking down the street towards someone and they cross over to the other side because they feel that you look a little bit intimidating. In fact, one incident that really stands out in my mind was when my brother was walking home from school and he, he would get stones thrown at him. He was only 11. Slavery ended years ago, but the effects and the impacts of it are still being felt today. In fact, I read an article the other day and it was saying how slave owners were still getting reimbursed from, slave owners were still getting reimbursed from the slaves they owned up until 2015. We as black people, black people are constantly having to navigate a system that has been designed to see us fail. It feels like we have to jump through a thousand hoops to get to the same, the same destination as our white counterparts. Now doing my research about the Beniba Slavery Centre, I found that um, the centre was the first of its kind in Scotland. It was a little surprising to me because Scot that it took so long because Scotland massively benefited from slavery and they really profited from it. In fact, the former rector at the University of Glasgow was a slave owner. I was speaking to um, my peers about what we kind of hoped this Beniba Slavery Centre would be and a lot of us were just hoping that it would become a safe space for black students where we can sort of hold educational events and recreational events. We were hoping that um, we would kind of, this is like the first step or the next step in the right direction towards reparative justice. 
thank you so much to everyone for the opportunity to be here today and kind of speak um, here today. And yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Ed Peggy Brinash, for asking me to come here and speak to everyone about this. But yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Toby. Um, we needed to hear what it is that students, especially Black students, can gain from a center like this, not just concerned about forwarding our, our research and our, our collaborative networks, but also what is it can, what else the center can be, particularly for Black students. So thank you. I hope we can talk a little bit more about this um, in, in the discussion component. Uh, next, I'd like us to turn our attention to Dr. Cleve Scott, who is a, a scholar specializing in the history of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, which apparently today is their Independence Day, so happy Independence. Uh, Cleve, take it away. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Peggy Bernash. I hope I have the pronunciation and good morning to I see Graham there and morning to everyone else listening. I hope my students from Keyville are online as well. I should be teaching from 12 to 1. So I have sent the link and asked them to join so at least they wouldn't file a complaint. <laughs> All right, today is indeed very significant for me. When I was asked to join this conversation and I recognize it would be on the 27th, I said, this would be an excellent opportunity. Why? Because Scotland, Glasgow, and St. Vincent and the Grandines have had a very long relationship. And as a scholar on St. Vincent and the Grandines and the wider Windward Islands, I don't think that as part of this process of reconciliation and reparation that we have recognized these specific linkages. Maybe we speak about Britain and British colonialism, we speak about slavery on all of the inequalities that have taken place in slavery. But as we have recognized across the Commonwealth Caribbean, particularly in CARICOM, the Caribbean community, is that we need to be on a part of reparation. And as part of this system, we need to recognize the various, the various connections. Now, if you take my name, Cleve McDonald Scott, McDonald and Scott, both on my mother's side and father's side have Scottish heritage. And obviously in my name, you can see that. So during the period of enslavement, a lot of the overseers were from Scotland. Not only overseers, during the period of uh, apprenticeship, we had Scottish stipendary magistrates, Alexander, um, the name slips me, um, John Anderson, John Anderson, you can read his journal, Journal of John Anderson. After emancipation, after we had the entire island practically owned by one family and one man, David Kennedy Porter, and then his family, Alexander Porter, who dropped out of school at age 16 and was in working in the shop in Scotland and Glasgow and came to St. Vincent and ran the entire island for almost 100 years, right? He and his family. So I'm very happy that the University of Glasgow has finally teamed up with the University of the West Indies. This is something we have been speaking for, for a long time. I, I remember as recently as almost 10 years ago, we had a visit from Professor Newman then. I sat with him and another colleague of, of oral history, and we spoke about how we can forge these links. So now that we have this memorandum of understanding, and now that you are launching Beniba Center, which is to highlight the importance of the role of the enslaved. Yes, we do not know a lot about Beniba, but we know a lot about enslaved people all across the Caribbean. On St. Vincent and the Grenadines, we are fortunate to have had the slave narrative of Ashton Warner, who, through whose eyes we can experience the, the, the life and tribulations of enslavement. So there, there are opportunities for a lot of collaboration. Graham mentioned 
uh, Ibu Kopa. And uh, well, Peggy knows that I am involved in the music industry. <laughs> I've had the opportunity to work on one of the biggest hits from the Caribbean. For those of you who don't know, Turn Me On by Kevin Little. I, I am worked on that song. And also I've had the opportunity, obviously, to work with many Caribbean mu musicians and live, including Toddwell. I had the opportunity to work with Toddwell across the region. The point is that we have opportunities as well to work on music because on St. Vincent and the Grandins, if you read the journal of John Anderson, you would hear him speak about the enslaved people singing Scottish folk songs. So the question is, how did this kind of music, these kinds of melodies, how did it influence the evolvement of the Caribbean folk and then the Calypso and then the Soka? So that when we, we look at how we can work together, it should not only about trying to recreate what was the nature of the punishment, what was the nature of the armed um, revolt, but we have to look at culturally how we have benefited uh, exchange across the border. How, as we usually say, the, the Caribbean, these marginal territories in particular, because we know a lot about the bigger territories. We know a lot about Jamaica. We know, we know a lot about, but we don't know enough about St. Vincent and the Grenadines and Grenada and Dominica and St. Lucia. And the government of St. Vincent and the Grenadines have just commissioned myself along with three other historians to write that history. 41 years of, after achieving political independence, okay? 41 years. So when we speak about reparations, we are not only speaking about giving funds, we are talking about giving opportunities. So we need to give students from the Caribbean the opportunity to come to Glasgow and experience how how? Because here you have Graham sitting in Glasgow, right? A Rastafari, a Rastaman sitting in Glasgow. So all people need to understand how Rastafari has evolved, not only to influence philosophically, but have entered into mainstream politics. Because when you take Rastafari for a long time, I and I don't mix with politics, <laughs> right? So what can we learn across the border between Scotland and the Caribbean? So there are many opportunities for collaboration with students, with faculty, um, not forgetting that the University of the West Indies we're in almost every territory through the open campus. We are online, we are on ground. We have a, a, a fort landed campus in Antigua. So we are now in, at Mona in Jamaica, St. Augustine in Trinidad and Tobago, Cable in Barbados, and we have five islands in Antigua and Barbuda, right? So there are many opportunities for us to work together. And we are happy that the University of Glasgow has been given this endowment and we would encourage other persons to come on board and help support the cause so that we could have a greater collaboration and we could move forward into the 21st century and beyond as a unified world, as a global world, as a world which black, white, Indian, Chinese could understand and appreciate. And we in the Caribbean have already mastered that. They, we are multiple races. We are Amerindian, we are European, we are African, we are Asian, we are Chinese. We, 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 we are everything. And we live together and we eat one another cuisine and so on. And when carnival time comes around, we all jump in the same band and enjoy the same music. So we can show the world how you can have greater unification. So I thank you very much, Peggy, for the invitation. And I wish Baniba all the best. I commit myself and my colleagues across the Caribbean to supporting this work because we believe in this and this will be in our lives work. So I thank you very much, Peggy, and I wish you and the center all of the best. Thank you so much, Cleve. There's so much there to, to chew on. And it was absolutely necessary that we had you here. We needed to have this launch with our, our institutional partner of the University of West Indies and have a representative speak and, and provide their thoughts on, on how best that we can, as a center, work with 
University of West Indies as well as its its students and and other other Caribbean students that may not necessarily be um, matriculating just yet. Uh, next, I'd like for us to listen to the new curator of slavery legacies for Glasgow Museums, Mr. Miles Greenwood. Miles. Thanks very much, Peggy. Um, and thanks everyone for having me. It's a real honor to be here today and to be sharing this panel alongside some real legends in their field. Uh, some of which I absolutely would not be here without, um, particularly shout out to Zandra and Graham who have for the longest time been doing a lot of really, really good work across Scotland and have really enabled me to be in this position, but also enabled a lot of these conversations such as the ones that we're having here today, laying a lot of the groundwork for things like the Beniba Centre for Slavery Studies. Um, so yeah, big thank you to you guys. Um, I'm glad that Peggy emphasised that I've been newly appointed, so I won't be giving you a comprehensive overview of our collection and all its connections to slavery today. Um, if you invite me back for the one year anniversary, hopefully I'll be able to give you a bit more on that then. Um, what I will say though is that this launch for the Beniba Centre for Slavery Studies is hugely significant, um, not just for the University of Glasgow, which in itself has really been leading the way in these issues of reparative justice across the UK, um, but it's also, I think, incredibly significant for Glasgow as a city. Um, particularly for Glasgow Museums, I really hope that we can do a lot of exciting collaborative work that your research will help us and in turn wherever possible we can help and support you. Um, Glasgow Museums, like the University of Glasgow, is fundamentally a colonial institution. Um, what I mean by that is both of these institutions and many others across Scotland developed alongside the British Empire. Um, and what that means is that um, the way that our collections, the way that our research, our worldview developed alongside colonialism. So the way we see people, the way we interpret different cultures, the way we tell history is all through the lens of largely white middle-class um, colonial uh, viewpoint of the world that, set, that looks at it as though we can, that it's our right to study, research and interpret how people live their lives. Um, so as part of my work, I hope that we can be able to recenter that narrative somewhat and begin to tell the stories of people whose voices have largely been silenced for so long, um, who have been left out of the historical narrative and add new layers of understanding to our shared history. Um, I know my colleagues at Glasgow Museums have been doing work in this area for a while. And we do have a blog called Glasgow Museums Slavery and where you can see some of the research that we've been doing. Um, I do have to say though that, that one of the challenges that we have as a museum is that we are restricted to a collection that, as I mentioned, has been built with those collecting practices that are largely from a Western perspective and have left out the voices and histories of people who are enslaved. And as uh, Dr. Cleaver was saying just before, those stories and histories do definitely exist. The culture exists and it still manifests itself today. Um, so how can we better tell the story of the enslaved people from their perspective when they've been for so long neglected? Um, it's a challenge for me personally, it's a challenge for us as an institution. Um, in my opinion, the material culture of enslaved people goes beyond things like shackles um, and goes beyond even the products of their exploitation. Um, one of the greatest acts of resistance to the slave trade, in my opinion, was that these diverse and rich cultures survived despite the brutal oppression of the slave trade. Um, and many of those cultures still survive and thrive to this day in religion, as Dr. Cleaver was saying, in music, in food, and in, in many, many more ways. Um, we have some collections that represent these cultures that we hope to bring out more. Um, and I hope that we'll also be able to look at ways that we can collect and more and 
better tell those stories and represent those cultures. Um, and I hope we're also able to connect and collaborate with people as widely as possible. As I said, these cultures are living things. They still matter to people today. They're still practiced today and they still have huge links to these histories of slavery um, and of colonialism. Um, these legacies deeply impact all our lives. So we have to try and connect them with people wherever possible. Um, to finish, I would just like to build on what people have been saying of how this center is named after Beniba. And as we've mentioned, we know very little about her. I suppose one of the real tragedies is that we know a lot more about her than we do a lot of other enslaved people. Um, we know that she was of Akan origin. We know that she was born on a Tuesday. And now we also know that she has a center named after her at the University of Glasgow. Um, I think that in itself is a hugely significant legacy. So I look forward to seeing how the University of Glasgow, how Peggy and all her colleagues build on that legacy and how we can all work together and all our affiliated organizations and all these interested people can work together to build on that legacy too. Uh, thank you, and thank you particularly to Peggy as well for inviting me here today. Thank you, Miles. Um, I will speak for myself and for my colleagues. We look forward to the collaborative nature of our future endeavors, especially to, to highlight, to retrace, to acknowledge, to shout out not just the exploitation and the brutality that happened, but also to to highlight the different ways that resilience of culture, of African cultures through music and food and, and other, other elements we've yet to even think about, we can do that as a, as a, as a, as a network. Mm -hmm. So our last speaker for today is Zandra Yemen, a tireless uh, community activist who many of you of Glasgow already know. Sandra, the floor is yours. Thank you, Peggy. Um, and I can't express enough what a privilege I feel to be invited along to speak at the opening of the Beniba Centre. Um, I feel extremely privileged and thank you very much to you for inviting me along and to share the panel with such amazing um, people who have been agitating and working um, to make these changes happen within our society for such a long time. And we have a long way to go, and we know, but the Beniba Centre, I would like to think, is part of that journey, part of that um, movement of change that we're seeing within academic oh. institutions, um, within our political and civic society, um, and within our museum and cultural heritage spaces. But I also think, as well as we're ce celebrating today the opening of the Beniba Centre, I think we also have to be mindful of this history. And, you know, as Professor Helen Minnis said, it's not just hi history, this is the now. So what is the now? What, what is it that we have to um, be mindful of and thinking about how do we move forward as a society in Scotland? Um, and we know that social scientists understand racism is a multi-dimensional and highly adaptive system. And it's a system that ensures an unequal distribution of resources between racial groups. Because white people build and dominate all significant institutions. And we will see that through the study, the, the Beniba um, Center, often at the expense of and on the uncompensated labor of other groups. And the interests are embedded in the foundation of our Western society. So to foster a culture of structural change, we need to become an anti-racist as a society. This means changing the way we think and act and being prepared to challenge ourselves and others to do the same. You know, many white people have extremely low thresholds for enduring any discomfort associated with challenges to their racial worldviews. And having an insight and understanding that whiteness is socialized into a deeply internalized sense of superiority and entitlement that we are either not consciously aware of or can never admit to ourselves, we become highly fragile in conversations about race. 
We experience a challenge to our racial worldview as a challenge to our very identities as good moral people. It also challenges our sense of rightful place and hierarchy. Thus, we perceive any attempt to connect us to the system of racism as a very unsettling and unfair moral offence. And this is why Boniba Centre is extremely important and all the collaborations that we hope to um, see happening as we go forward, because structural racism is deeply ingrained in our society. And the result of this is that minority ethnic people, especially those who are more visibly minority ethnic, experience everyday racism. And this has a big impact on their lives. It pervades all areas of life and is hard to challenge. So in some ways it can have a bigger impact than the obvious forms of racism. And everyday racism acts to silence and demean minority ethnic people and reinforces the inequalities they face. So as Miles said, you know, when we look at this um, history or history, um, Scotland's links to the enslavement of African people, Scotland's links to empire, people have came through this survived it, have been resilient, and they're continuing to have to show that resilience in modern contemporary Scotland today. Because structural racism can't be dealt with simply by telling people it's wrong to be racist, and it can't be dealt with by holding diversity events, which often reinforce perceptions of difference and racial stereotyping. One of the ways forward is as Cleve Scott said, looking at the collaboration between the Caribbean and the pe people in the Caribbean and the people in Scotland. And I um, advocate that wholeheartedly because acknowledging our past helps us understand our present. And I'd like to think we as a collective, as a Scottish society, will help to change our future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sandra. And so with her last words of moving forward by taking the steps to in, embrace collaborative natures, collaborative networks between the Caribbean and Scotland, this is how we accept that the, that the past is still the present, that history is not over. So I, I welcome everyone to ask us questions. We'd like to engage and, and push forward some discussions as to what you've heard, any questions you, you feel compelled you need to hear a little bit more about. We still have another 10 minutes, almost 15 minutes before we're actually um, done. And we will have an actual performance that has been pre-recorded for us to, to continue our celebration before we end. So if there are any questions that anyone would like to, to bring forward and we can begin that just now. I'll just ask if Christine has already found any questions. Is there anything that anyone has put forward so far. I don't see any questions in the chat chat yet. Um, but this is Christine here. Um, <laughs> but something I wanted to, to quickly add was just thank you so much to everyone for um, coming and, and joining us today and to the amazing panel. And um, I'm sometimes worried that it's, it's very easy for me to take for granted that I'm constantly surrounded by all these incredibly extraordinary people you know like we think of ourselves as, as as just Glaswegians or just Scottish people getting on with our work um but the work that I've seen Peggy and Sandra and Jackie and now Miles um and Helen doing is has just been absolutely incredible and inspiring so oh we have our first question from um Chantelle George and she has a question for, for Dr. Scott. Um, she wants to ask how institutions in the UK work with the University of the West Indies to collect and share oral history collections of the Caribbean. 
Um, I know you've done a lot of work on that, Dr. Scott. Did you hear the question? Okay. Yeah, we, we, we have had a, a long project. Um, I'm trying to remember the name of the scholar. Uh, Mary Chamberlain, Mary Chamberlain, Professor Mary on. Chamberlain. It's still going on. Oh. Hello? Me. <laughs> Sorry? Jackie, I think your mic might have been unmuted. Please continue, Cleve. Yes, we, we had a long project with Professor Mary Chamberlain, particularly looking at Barbados. So there's that long co collection. At Cayville, we have had the oral history project for nearly 50 years. And we are in the process of, of putting that on a portal which can be become available. Um, um, we have just signed up with another university. I, I can't announce the name of the university. The project was just, just, just approved. All right. In fact, we have a meeting next week to announce when we're going to launch make this major announcement. Okay. So there are a number of initiatives ongoing. And if you're interested in our collection, you can go on to the UE website. Um, we are on Facebook as well. And you can contact us. Thank you, Dr. Scott. We have another question here from Fergus Smith um, asking about an outline future research program for the Beniva Centre of Slavery Studies. So I think that's that's really a question for for, for Dr. Bernash and um, the rest of us here at Glasgow. Peggy? As the program is still evolving, one of the, the major uh, objectives is to create a whole new set of courses and programs of study that will also engage and link into um, a master's program. So there's a master's program, but we're also thinking long-term of undergraduate programs as well for study on slavery, contemporary legacies, and several other things. Um, beyond beyond uh, programs of study and courses, some of the networks that we want to do is eventually create enough of a, enough networks that we can bring in um, scholars for study, having them work with students. Um, at the moment, the center does not have a physical presence. It is virtual, but the, I, the idea is that in the future there will be, that we will be housed in a physical uh, built environment. But at the moment, we are developing a number of courses to work with other scholars within the University of Glasgow, as well as in converse, we're already in conversation with a few, few lecturers at UWE, University of West Indies. But we're also thinking about trying to expand that and bring guest lecturers in from, from other centers and universities. Thanks, Peggy. And Lisa is asking, there's so many Caribbean archives in need of help with preservation. Is this something that the center may be able to assist with? And I think Graham Campbell actually has some, I know has some ideas on that and maybe some of the other panelists do as well. But also there's a lot of um, great work going on at the University of the West Indies. Um, one of our um, colleagues there, Dr. Tara Innes has been involved with the British Library Endangered Archive Program. Um, I know Rachel Douglas is working with archives in Haiti. Um, I don't know who else wants to speak to that. Yes, well the archives across the Caribbean need a lot of help, particularly in the smaller territories. I would tell you, for example, right in St. Vincent and the Grandines, we do not have a microfilm machine. And it will be the same thing across. If you go to St. Lucia, they only have one. Um, there's a lot of digitization has been going on, but if you don't have machines to read these material, it doesn't make any sense. The, the Endangered Archives program with the British Library they have been around all across the region, including St. Vincent, uh, Barbados, Grenada, the Bahamas. But you need more, more equipment. I would say that is the, the, the most important need now. 
um, of course, continual digitization as well. So then I would add to the uh, former question that I answered, one of the other programs that we need to, one of the other objectives that we need to include in this, now speaking with or, or listening to Clive, would be collaborative grant writing so that we can find the funds, find funding to, to preserve these endangered archives that, it, as, as Clive said, that are, are in particularly vulnerable positions in the Lesser Antilles or the Windward Islands or other small, um, small islands. I was just going to say um, about um, endangered archives. I think um, Cleve is, is is right that the um, and and Lisa that the situation is is really bad across um, across the Caribbean, um, right across the Caribbean. And I've been looking particularly at the case of Haitian archives um, and um, and applying for the Endangered Archives Programme with the British Library and the Prince Klaus Fund in the Netherlands. And um, one problem has also been COVID-19, which has had a, a massive impact everywhere, but also particularly in the Caribbean, um, also particularly in Haiti. But um, uh, one um, consequence of that was that the, the entire round of um, the British Library's Endangered Archives Programme was delayed until next April. So, um, but I think I think this is one of the most important aspects that we need to look at is the question of archives and preserving archives. Um, because as Miles was saying, um, you know, we need to go back to the sources. Um, we need to see what's there and we need to preserve as much as we can. But definitely, I think Peggy's idea about um, joint funding bids, I think, that's really what I hope is one of the things born out of the Beniva um, Centre and our collaboration with the, the University of the West Indies, but also other organizations as well. Thank you so much, Rachel. <clears throat> I think we have time for one last question. If there, there is, is a question, there is a question from Mary Taylor, and this is a, this is a question from Miles and Graham and Sandra, but it's I think it's a question that everyone in the city has an opinion on. Do you think the city of Glasgow will have a slavery museum? Um, I suppose that's mine partly, but also Zandra's. So uh, Zandra's been working on this for way longer than I have, uh, and as Claire have, uh, to get a museum. And uh, for the last two years, we've been working together on a, co a, a committee specifically to sort of work on the, the content and the international connections. We've been advised by Liverpool International Museum of Slavery as well. Uh, the answer to that shorthand is yes, I'm confident there will be. Uh, we've been looking actively for the last two years as to what we could do in the existing museum estate. Clues are there that from Liverpool's experience originally, they started the, their museum as a, a wing within one of the, the, I think it was the Maritime Museum, if I remember rightly, um, that they had it as a wing within an existing museum. We could possibly start that way. It depends which one of the buildings we choose to use it from. I have my own ideas about which one of our museums it should be, and I think that's well known publicly what that is, but I can't prejudice the outcome because we're currently consulting the public on that. Um, so it's up to the, the people of Glasgow what they, where they think is the appropriate place, whether it should be a new building, whether it should be an existing building. That, and indeed, there's a national conversation going on across Scotland. Greenock is making a very strong claim that it should be the, the home of a national museum. I rather like the idea of having something like the VNA where there's a multiple site uh, museum, which takes this across the country. So uh, I'm easy, but as long as the big place is in Glasgow, I don't mind. <laughs> as, as I said, uh, just to add to what Graham's saying, um, the Coalition for Racial Equality and Rights, um, you know, started doing work um, in 2001, looking at Scotland's built heritage and how that, um, um, the connection between the transatlantic slave trade and bringing that out of academic spheres and academic books and bringing it into public consciousness, which then hired Dr. Stephen Mullen, who wrote the book It Was the Us. And then the next phase was looking at um, a museum because um, museum spaces are extremely important spaces in Scotland, particularly in Glasgow, they're all free. Many of us who, who grew up in, in Glasgow know that we, from 
early years right through to our adult years and when we have our own children and so forth we, we visit these spaces but what we did recognize a good few years ago before we launched the museum campaign um, in 2017 it wasn't a slavery museum that was, was something that we should be exploring it should be a museum of empire colonialism slavery migration where we're drawing in all the kind of strands um, of our histories and how of, of our interconnection. I mean, one of the things Cleve um, Scott brought up was when you look at the Caribbean and all the different racial groups that are that are involved in the Caribbean and looking at how we thread our histories together and thread the history of repression and looking at anti-blackness because it's something that happens in Scotland, but it's a global issue. So I, like Graham, agree we will be seeing a national museum. Um, and it will be up to the public to decide where that location will be, despite Graham the fact that we do want a specific space, but it's not going to be up to me and you, <laughs> nor should it be. Thank you so much, everyone. I'm so glad that we had a short time to reach out, join you, you join us in celebrating Scotland's first dedicated research center for slavery studies, historical, as well as contemporary, also in terms of trafficking. We know there's a lot of work to do. We've come a good way, but we still have a long way to go. And I hope you got the impression that from everyone that has spoken, from Jackie, from Graham, from Helen, from Toby, from Cleve, Helen, Zandra, Miles, myself, Christine, those who were able to help out from, from the very beginning, Professor Simon Newman, certainly Dr. Stephen Mullen, and other names that I I'm, have not been able to bring up at this moment. I hope you can join us in this work that we are moving forward. And hopefully, we will be able to properly challenge structural inequalities, that this anti-racism activism will not be in vain, will not be a form of tokenism, will have long lasting transformative effect. Before we go, I would like to um, say thank you again to all our speakers for taking the time to join us launching our new center. And as this is a celebration, as well as a rallying cry, I wanted to provide, well, rather not provide, but one of our own Scotland-based but African-American opera singers, Andrea Baker, has allowed us to <clears throat> use a pre-recorded performance of the spiritual song called Ain't That Good News from the Edinburgh International Festival. That is what we'll leave you with, that performance. And I hope to see you in the near future. We've got a lot of work to do. I got a robe painted at Kingdom, painted at your news. I got a robe painted at Kingdom, painted at your news. I'm not gonna leave the whispers, but show you up my cross.